us are responsible of this failure. Not only the great powers, but the African powers, the, the NGO, all the international community. It is a genocide which has been committed. The Rwandan genocide, leaving the UN Secretary General utterly powerless. It began with the deadly shooting down of the plane of President Yuvenal Habyarimana on the 6th of April 1994. From the very next day, a series of systematic reprisals as the majority Hutus massacred the Tutsi minority. Lists of names were composed, those to die, those to live. The controversial radio station known as 1000 Hills called for murder. People's ethnicity as indicated on their identity cards, making it easy to put in place a programme of extermination. Checkpoints were put up around the capital Kigali and across the country. At the height of the massacres, Every minute, five people were being killed, usually by machete or club. Thirteen weeks later, around 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus had been murdered. That's 75% of the Tutsi population assassinated. And more than four million people had fled to neighbouring countries. In the end, France replaced UN peacekeepers, but Operation Turquoise, which began at the end of June 1994, was highly controversial, accused of protecting Death Quad soldiers in the name of military accords agreed with the Hutu regime. It didn't stop. It didn't. Until the end of the genocide, arms were delivered in Goma, paid for by Rwanda, often with the help of French banks. Souvent de Banque Française. The journalist Patrick de Saint-Exupéry has campaigned tirelessly to make France accept its responsibility for what happened. For a long time, France accused the Tutsi RPF rebels, who eventually took power, of being the ones who killed the president, leading to the violence. Diplomatic relations were severed. Rwanda, now headed by Paul Kagame, moved away from France. The country went into the Commonwealth, English even becoming the official language. Between Kigali and Paris now, though, some reconciliation. In a sign of the times, a former military Hutu official was found guilty here in France earlier this year of crimes against humanity. 20 years after the genocide then, Revisited takes us back to Rwanda. In this report from Catherine Norris-Trent and Willy Brassiano, we see the country of thousands of hills, perhaps in the process of becoming the Switzerland of Africa. Every day from 7am, the clanging of tools resounds around this construction site in Kigali. Work is advancing at a frenetic pace. A year ago, it was a banana grove. Now it's part of the Rwandan capital's building boom. Construction tycoon Vincent Sekimondo is funding this lot of new houses. Do you think they'll be finished today so they can start laying the tiles? Yes, they can start putting in the tiles. They're going to finish up both parts here. These 20 new homes are set to be top of the range with all the latest finishes, designed for Kigali's burgeoning middle class. I want to do this because when you love your country, you want it to make progress. It's natural to do that. I travel a lot and I see what's happening abroad. I want to bring some of those changes back home. Vincent owns a city centre hotel and property to rent and the homes on his estates are selling fast. He's become one of Rwanda's nouveau riche. I'm going to show you the other place where we've built houses. That's where we started out. Vincent's first housing estate is right by the place former Rwandan President Habyarimana's plane was shot down, sparking the genocide. Today, there are 87 brand new houses. Vincent is extremely proud of his achievements. A Tutsi, he grew up in exile in Burundi, like many thousands of others, he came back to Rwanda in 1994. The fact that it's like that after the genocide, it's amazing. Those who survived came together to develop the country. I still rejoice that the killing is over and that we're dedicating ourselves to rebuilding our country.
This is how the Rwandan government hopes to rebuild the capital. President Paul Kagame's vision for Kigali as an ultra-modern world city. Authorities have put together this ambitious master plan for Kigali by 2040. The dream? To build the biggest high-tech hub in Africa with a Manhattan-style central business district. But in the meantime, Kigali is a city where expansion coexists with poverty, an urban sprawl in mainly rural Rwanda. We're in the Nyakabanda neighborhood, shown around by Emmanuel, who's lived here all his life. This is where I live. It's a poor neighborhood. Kigali is developing a lot, but they're only concentrating on the city center. Emmanuel was a killer back in 1994. After serving eight years in prison, he's come back home. He manned a Hutu roadblock in these streets. With the death squads, the Interhamway, he admits killing some 60 people during the genocide. They posted us at roadblocks and ordered us to kill Tutsis. They'd go into houses, get them, and then kill them in the streets. I was with them. We were all together. They used to call it working. 20 years on, Emmanuel is far from proud of his past and wants to show us just how much he's changed. He takes us to meet his wife, Vestine, who's not only a Tutsi, but a genocide survivor. She was eight years old when both her parents were slaughtered. But astonishingly, she doesn't see her husband as a murderer. When the genocide finished, we hated all the Hutus. We didn't even want to say hello to them or walk along the same path. But I thought about it as I grew up. For me, the Hutus are the men I saw at my door who'd come to hurt me. Because I didn't see Emmanuel at my door, I don't see any reason not to live with him. And Vestine believes Emmanuel truly regrets his crimes. She even accompanied him through his trial at a local gachacha court. In the aftermath of the genocide, though, their relationship raised eyebrows on both sides. In the beginning, when we lived together, there were some Hutu neighbors who said, how can you love this Tutsi woman? Have you forgotten already that it's the Tutsis who put us all in prison? And I had to tell them, let that go. It's in the past now. This couple reflect the changing mentalities of Rwanda, a people not forgetting, but moving on beyond their devastating past. That's especially true of the younger generation, the 60% of Rwandans aged 25 or under. The bright young things of Kigali are internet savvy, impatient for the 4G phone network about to be switched on in the capital. Marcel is a 25-year-old IT entrepreneur who set up his own business three years ago. Many people that are using internet now, also they use the mob phone. The change is uh, according to the, the technology, the penetration of internet and technology in the, the rural areas, even in Chigari also. He's launched his own news website, now the second most visited in the country, getting 85,000 hits every day. Marcel was left an orphan by the genocide and had to care for himself growing up. But that motivated him for success. It pushed me without anything or hobbies or whatever. No, I was focusing on my school and business. I finished my secondary school at 17 with the vision of just creating my life because I was not intending my parents to come and help me or other family members. I, was, I, I knew that I was there alone to make my life. More recently, Marcel did have a helping hand from his fellow IT enthusiasts here in Kigali's K-Lab, 
an open space, free internet zone for wannabe CEOs. Ifo is my friend Mutangana, he's my good friend, fellow entrepreneur, yes. Financed by the Rwandan government, K-Lab is supposed to have a Silicon Valley feel, with everything you need for your tech startup. I come, I develop my, my, my solution. After developing my solution, they call my client here, so I can pitch before them. The product is a new smartphone app Aphrodis has developed to give Rwandans in rural areas better access to healthcare. You just type in your symptoms to receive an SMS with medical advice and contacts. At least uh, you will when the application goes online. Yeah, it can work because he's helping them, he's helping the community, but also it will make money. Yeah, and uh, we tested with 5,000 people and 4,210 responded positively. Marcel and Aphrodis are hungry for progress, and they're not alone in this fast-changing city. It's a relentless march forwards. Take this staggering example. A part of the central neighborhood of Kyovu has been razed to the ground, bulldozed by authorities for commercial development, and 250 households ordered to move to the outskirts of town, 15 kilometers away. Hyacinth was forced to move here in 2007, her former home destroyed. We had problems adjusting to life here. We were used to life in the city. Everything was easy there. When we arrived here, the shops weren't open, and the people who worked in the city had a lot of problems because they had to travel there by foot. Hyacinth and her family were too poor to choose otherwise. Her father was killed in the genocide. So they accepted this new home the government has partially funded, rather than receive a modest compensation payment. Those who didn't want to come here received a cheque and bought a house elsewhere, those who could afford to anyway. We didn't have the means to do that, so we were obliged to come and live here. Other poor families also told us they were left with no real option. Rwandan authorities promoted this relocation program as a way to clean up Kigali's slums. The robust new homes do have running water and electricity. However, moving hundreds of poor families to the edge of the capital, even in better conditions, hasn't helped to drive down crime. Keeping order is taken very seriously in today's Rwanda. Alongside the national police and military, brigades of community police survey the streets. We had security problems in the recent past, even people throwing grenades in attacks. It's logical that they target crowded areas. A series of isolated grenade attacks have hit Rwanda in recent years. The government blames rebels and dissidents based abroad. But one thing's for certain, you're now watched wherever you go, and strict public order rules are in place. Hey, why did you stop here? Hi. His car won't start, right? Hey, you, you're blocking the road. Mm. Do you want us to give you a push? Tade is the supervisor of a patrol of local volunteers. In total, there are 175 in this area of Kigali alone. They patrol the streets every afternoon and night until dawn. Most of the time, they aren't hunting down attackers, but acting as the eyes of the police. It's not easy for the national police force to get access to all parts of the population. But because we operate in local cells, it's very easy for us to reach every single person. If someone's attacked, for example, we can pass the information onto the police straight away. 
Post-genocide laws have increased state control over everyday life. For example, Rwanda is a rare example of an African country where motorbike helmets and seatbelts must be worn while driving. If not, you'll quickly get a hefty fine. This has become an intensely disciplined society. And that's also true at an individual level. Some people here have made huge changes to their lives, like Emmanuel, the former killer, who we catch up with on a Sunday. He tells us he's totally reformed since leaving prison. I was a big drinker. I chased a lot of women. I didn't smoke, but I did everything else, especially chasing girls. But now I've repented and found the Lord. Twice a week, Emmanuel and his family worship at this small evangelical church where he's found his salvation. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Twenty years after he manned the barricades in the genocide, Emmanuel has had a veritable renaissance. Now he even preaches to the faithful urging them to learn the lessons of 1994. We, the Rwandan people, have always been characterized by divisions. We characterized ourselves as Hutus or Tutsis, and that drove us to genocide. If someone does you harm, don't take revenge for the hurt he has caused you. Forgive him. That is what our God in heaven asks of us. In many ways, Rwandan society seems to have been almost miraculously reborn. Mixed marriages are no longer taboo, evoking the differences between Hutus and Tutsises instead. Kigali is an oasis of development in a still largely poor country. But there is now a feeling of faith in the future. A very different life for those now living in Kigali, 20 years after the Rwandan genocide. Well, that's all from this week's edition of Revisit. More editions uh, coming up very soon here on Force My Care. So keep watching if you can. <laughs>